A very good night to you and a very big warm welcome to you on this, the first night of our mission. Whether you're coming to us through Zoom or Facebook Live, on your phone or on your, on your computer, Kate Mila Falcha, you are very welcome. Our mission, as you probably know at this stage, is called Moving Forward in Hope. And this is the evening part of the daily mission schedule. So hopefully you've been involved in mission activities throughout the day. I'm delighted that you're here and that you can give this the time and that you can join us tonight. The format of the night is our special guest gives their input for about 20 minutes. Then there's a transition piece of music to give us a chance to collect <clears throat> your questions. Therefore, We'd love to get your questions and to submit a question. You look at your screen there and you can see there's a Q&A box on the bottom, an icon. And please, if you have a question at any stage, just input that. And Francis Rowland is in the background collecting those questions. And after the piece of music, she'll feed them into us. She'll feed them to, to our guests to respond. And we absolutely love your participation. So please do. Tonight, our special guest is Oshin McConville. Oshin, as many of you might know, is a gifted cross Madeleine and Armagh footballer. He played himself fantastically through the 90s and the 20s. And you probably know the song, The Two Johnnies Could Have Been County. Well, Oshin McConville was county. He was an All-Ireland medal winner, an All-Star twice, and he kicked the most scores in the history of Ulster football. So he's absolutely amazing. Now, a problem emerged for him in his life when he was at secondary school. And this was, he had started off having a bit of fun with putting a little bit of money on things now and then, and it became an issue. He developed an addiction to gambling and it was a huge problem. The gambling was giving him as much of a buzz as the football was. Now, I read Oshin's book, The Gambler. You can see it there. And now there's more football in this than gambling. But from it, I can tell you that he's very much coming from a football family, their identity their hobby, I won't say their religion, but definitely the religion was linked in a way to football. For Oshin, football was and still is very much part of his life. It's his gift. But things did get very rough with the gambling. However, with the help of Kuhn Wirra and Sister Concilio and Gamblers Anonymous, he tackled this. And like with any addiction, I presume, Oshin continues to tackle it at, at the moment and always, but well done to him on this. Now, in recent years and as recent as today, Oshin works as a sports commentator. So you'll see him on television, you'll hear him on radio, but he's also an addiction counsellor. As well as that, he's a role model for young people and he works with, I was just checking with him before, at least three different teams of young people training them in the football field. Now, talking to us from his home place in Armagh, his theme is starting afresh. Over to you, Oshin McConville. Good evening, everybody. Um, I would love to have been uh, visiting Kerry today. It would have been a, a, a lovely break uh, to, get, to get down there. I always love to get, to get down to Kerry, but I'm, I'm speaking here from my home, and I suppose that's the new way of things. Um, I'm going to talk now for about 20 minutes just on, on uh, what a lot of people would say my favourite favorite subject, and that is myself. Um, but I suppose I'm going to start at the beginning. Um, and I know tonight is about starting afresh, but I think I have to put it, my life and my experiences into some sort of perspective for people uh, in order for you to understand uh, my story. Uh, so my story begins in 1975. I was born in a small village called South Armagh. Um, the village I was brought up in was predominantly, um, it was dominated by the Troubles. Uh, I grew up in the 70s, 80s, 90s. It was dominated by the Troubles. Killing, shooting, bombings were uh, commonplace day in, day out. Um, 
it was something which was just a part of life for us. Um, like if my, I have three kids now, I have a nine year old, a seven year old and a three year old. And it would fill me full of dread if, if those kids were growing up in the, in the era that I grew up in. Um, and thankfully they don't. Um, but when I was growing up, I suppose if you were to ask my family uh, what sort of kid I was, they would say that I was very, very, very uncomplicated. Because as Mary has alluded to, uh, my family was steeped in GA. Um, I, um, I grew up in a household where it was commonplace for us to spend the weekend just going to championship matches. It didn't matter where they were. Uh, a lot of my early holidays I spent in Kerry. Uh, people used to go to the beach and people would go to see different sites and different things. When we went down there, we used to take in at least uh, two or three championship games in, in Kerry and also um, the Kerry uh, inter-county team training. And that's the, that was the mentality that I grew up in. But as I say, the reason why I say I was my life was very, why my family would say my life was very, very uncomplicated was that the only thing I was really interested in was football. Um, I went to school because I had to. Uh, I went to Mass because I had to. Um, and the one passion in my life and the one thing that I loved was Gaelic football. And I loved it from the very first moment I picked up a football. And I was always the little guy who was in the field, kicking the balls back out from behind the goals. didn't matter who was training. Under 10s, 12s, 14s, 16s, seniors. It didn't matter. As I say, I was always there. The football field was about 100 yards, maybe less, from where I lived. Um, and as I said, that was the only thing I had any interest in. I have very, uh, I suppose, shattered memories, if you like, from being very, very young, growing up in the area that I grew up in. But I do remember at four or five years of age saying to myself that I wanted to be the best Gaelic footballer I could possibly be. How was I going to achieve that? I was going to achieve that through practice. So therefore, that's exactly what I did every single day. Things changed for me a little bit at 11 years of age. I was leaving my own primary school in Cross McLean to go to a, a grammar school in, in Newry. Um, the problem with me going to the grammar school was that I sort of had a fair idea the only reason why they were taking me was that I could play football and play football well, even at that stage. Um, and I was full of insecurities. And the insecurities were around if I was going to be academically good enough to go to that school. And if I was going to struggle in certain subjects and uh, all those insecurities I had were, they weren't unfounded. In fact, you know, within probably three or four weeks of being in there, I realized that I was really, really struggling. Put me into PE, put me in after school football and I was excelling. And, and as far as I was concerned, that was enough. Uh, and that kept me going and that kept me in that school. But uh, at 11 years of age, I started searching for something outside of sport and outside of school. And uh, my life was a change forever at 14 years of age. I walked into a bookmaker's and I had 50p each way on a horse. Uh, it was in the Grand National. So it was very acceptable for a 14-year-old lad to be in that book. Um, and when I went in there, I loved everything about it. And I shouldn't have, because I'm sure there's lots of people on in here who've been in the bookies before, walked into the bookies. If you've walked into a modern day bookmaker, you'll realize that it's pretty plush surroundings, multiple widescreen TVs, nice, comfortable seats, tea, coffee, biscuits, a very comfortable place to spend the evening or the afternoon. That wasn't the case with me. I walked into a smoke filled room at the back of a pub. For a young lad who was interested in sport and health and fitness, it should have had no interest for me. But in fact, it sparked lots of interest. And I got a real buzz out of just being in there. Then I got a real buzz out of, I suppose, winning. Then it didn't matter whether I won or lost. It was just about putting on that bet. That was my fix. And for anybody who's on here who maybe doesn't understand gambling as an addiction, um, if you can imagine the very vivid images we see on television of people who are strung out in drugs, on uh, heroin in particular, and they do anything to get that next hit, uh, that's the way I was. Uh, my hit was getting the money together, who can scam and scheming, begging, borrowing, stealing, in order to get the money to have that bet. At 17 years of age, I was already deep in a chronic gambling addiction. I hid this uh, from the people around me. 
and there was a couple of reasons why I hid it. I hid it because I was ashamed and I was I was embarrassed. I knew a lad at my age shouldn't have been doing this, but as I say, at 17 years of age, I already was in the midst of a serious gambling addiction. I couldn't arrest it. I didn't know how to arrest it. Um, it was a lonely journey. Um, I was, was lots of times, lots of false dawns where I thought, you know, I need to share this with somebody. But uh, I was incapable of it. Gambling stripped me of a lot of things. It stripped me of... When I stopped gambling, I was financially bankrupt. I was emotionally bankrupt. Um, and I suppose when I talk about my gambling, a lot of people, first thing they think about is, you know, your finances, you're, you're broke and you owe money and all those sort of things. And, and that was true. And that was a large part. I would never shy away from that part of things. But the biggest problem for me when I ended up in treatment in the treatment center in Galway was that I was trying to turn things around. And if we get on to the next topic, um, actually, let's go back for a second. I didn't really feel as if I had much hope. I went to Tipperary and met a nun called Sister Concilio. Um, and when I met Sister Concilio, she was the first person to tell me I was addicted. Because believe it or not, folks, even at 30 years of age, 29, I was almost 30 at the time. And my... The image I had in my head of somebody who was addicted was the gay who was laying on the park bench with a bottle of wine and a brown bag around it. And I had got through my life thinking that, that when I looked in the mirror, I didn't see that person. When I realized that I was functioning and holding down a job and playing inter county football, that didn't fit the bill of somebody who was in addiction. And yet I was chronic. And yet, um, I woke up every day feeling the need to have a bet. I woke up, a serious event happened in my life in 1999. My father was diagnosed with cancer. He was given roughly um, five or six months to live. I didn't go and see my father during that time. As a football team, we were starting to become successful. We won our first Ulster title in 18 or 19 years. And as a result of that, we were playing Mead in an all Ireland semi-final. And uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to play in the game because my father was literally on his last legs. But my father sent word out that he wanted me to go and play in the game. And uh, I went and I played in the game. And directly after the game, my cousin came rushing in the change rooms. He said, listen, uh, don't get changed. Um, just get your stuff, put in the bag. We got a guard escort from Coat Park directly to the border. The whole way up the road that day, I said to myself three things, three, a mantra. I had three things in my head. First thing I was going to do was tell my father I loved him, so I never told him that before. Second thing I was going to do was tell my family what was going on. And the third thing I was going to do was ask for the help that I needed. And, I, and, and at that stage, the help that I yearned for. And uh, it turns out I didn't have the courage to do that. I walked into that hospital. I didn't tell my father I loved him. Uh, my father died on the Wednesday. Um, my gambling went from the money increased the time increased. But the final piece of the jigsaw for me and my addiction was the things I was willing to do uh, in order to get the money to have the bet. And as I say, my father died on the Wednesday. I had no tears from my father. And when I look back at all the things that gambling took from me, that's the thing that it, that, that it took the most. I had no self-respect and no self-esteem, no integrity. Relationships were breaking down all the time. Friendships, family members, the guys I played football with. I couldn't look at them in the eye because I wasn't doing the same things that they were doing away from the field because I was a slave to my addiction. But I had no tears from my father in 1989. I was incapable of them. First time I cried at my father's uh, grave was 2006. I'd been to treatment. I'd come out. And uh, I started to get a handle on my emotions. I started to learn about my addiction and, and the things that I had stunted along the way. Um, and I started to, to live a different life. I didn't just go in there and stop gambling. They didn't give me a tablet. As Mary already alluded to, I still walk on, on not gambling every day. Now, it's not something I think about anymore. It's not something that dominates my life. But it's something that I am very, very aware of and very conscious of. 
How do I stop that? Um, how, how did I start afresh? Well, first of all, I went into residential treatment. I spent 13 weeks in a treatment centre in Galway. Then I, uh, my sister looked after all my finances, so that was squared away. And then I started to try and make amends to the people around me that had hurt. And that is very, very difficult considering the tale of destruction that I had left behind me. Um, I, think, I think that when I talk about starting afresh, the biggest, the biggest thing that, that I found, and, and I, I, I remember listening to a gay called Tony Adams and a lot, a lot of people on who are of a certain vintage on here will remember Tony Adams who captained uh, Arsenal and England. And I remember him saying one night that the greatest thing he got um, whenever he stopped gambling was his thoughts, his feelings, and his emotions. And the worst thing he got back whenever he got, uh, got into recovery was his thoughts, his feelings, and his emotions. And uh, I wanted those emotions back. I yearned to have those back. I didn't want to be um, stony-faced when my father died. I didn't want to not have that, um, that emotion that everybody else had. All I yearned for whenever I gambled was a normal life. I was a very, very jealous young man. What was I jealous of? I was jealous of normality. I was jealous of the people who I seen who had normality in their lives. I was jealous of the people who, um, who went through their lives as I seen it in a normal way. They functioned in a normal way. They got up and they went to work. They come home from work. They were able to talk to people, able to look you in the eye. I spent the most of my time uh, in the prime of my life. If I wasn't in the bookies, if I wasn't playing football, I had my uh, head buried under the covers in my bedroom. And the reason for that was that I wasn't able to function in the same society as everybody else. I didn't have the confidence to do that. I found gambling at 14 years of age and I buried myself out. And I buried all those emotions and I suppressed all those emotions in my gambling. And when I found emotions, I started to realize all of the things that I had missed out on. And when people talk to me about starting afresh, I started living my life at 30 years of age. And I have learned more in the last 16 years. I have been able to love. I've been able to care. I've been able to show people a different side of me. And I was only able to do that with help. And the other thing that came into my life, when I walked into Sister Concilios in Galway, um, I said to the nurse, the nurse who was doing the admissions for me was, uh, when she told me what the program was, I said I was going to struggle with one thing, and that was the religious side of things. And I remember Sister Concilio coming in one day, and she said the, you know, that the nurse, whose, whose name was Josephine, was, was after telling her that I thought I'd struggle with the religious side of things. And she sat me down and she said, Oshin, religious religion is for people who don't want to go to hell. Spirituality is for people who've been to hell and back. And when she said that, it triggered a whole set of different emotions, uh, a whole set of different thoughts. And when I realized that, um, that I needed faith in my life, um, when I needed a little bit of hope, that that's where I was going to get it. And uh, I got down on my knees every morning and I said a prayer. And I thanked God every night I went, went to bed. And that's how simple it was for me. And anything that I couldn't deal with in that time, especially in those first 12 months, when for me it was really like a roller coaster ride, just holding on, holding on, holding on. To see, can I stay in recovery? See, can I stay away from gambling and get my life back on track? Some, sometimes stuff was over, very overwhelming for me. And I felt as if I couldn't deal with it. So what did I do? I turned it over to God. I passed it on to God. I wasn't asked this evening 
to come on and um, talk about my faith or uh, how religion had a, played a part, but but it did. It played a crucial part. And I always talk, talk about um, my recovery in, in a couple of different aspects. As I say, the finances are a very real thing. Very, very real thing. And that was one side of it. The second side of it was my emotions. And the third side of it was my faith. And whenever um, Sister Concilio talked to me about, um, about religion, um, whenever she talked to me about um, how I was going to live my life. So in order for me to start afresh, lots of things had to change in my life. Lots of things. So the people I hung around with, the things I was doing, places I was hanging out with, the friends I had, all those sort of things, they all had to change. And as they changed, my mentality changed. But one thing that didn't change was that there was things in my life, like there is in everybody's life every single day, that I wasn't that comfortable with dealing with at that time. And I was able to pass them on because I had my faith. I was able to pass them on to God. I know that eventually a lot of those things I was going to have to deal with. But for then, I was parking it. And I was living in the day and in the moment. And I suppose if there's any message that I you know, would leave with you guys is that um, if, if there's certain things, if, there's, if, if life becomes a thing that you can't deal with, chop it up into little pieces and deal with it one piece at a time and let God take care of the other stuff until you're ready to get to that. And that's the way I live my life today. I know it's a cliche. It is a day at a time. For me, it's an hour at a time. It's two hours. And I'll finish on this point. When I went into residential treatment, they didn't give me a, a, a pill. They didn't give me a tablet to say, you know, you're cured. They give me the tools in which I work with today. And uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that, Mary. And if you want to uh, come back in, if there is any questions, hopefully we can address them at the end. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Oshin. I really appreciate that. I was so drawn into it and listening to it. My heart was going out to you and just with admiration as well. Now, while Francis Rowland gathers the questions together, we're going to listen to a piece of music. And it's very much that call for help that you were talking about there. The name of the song is His Name. The group is He Is We. And it's sung here by Yvonne. Why am I so afraid of the night? My silhouette, it taunts me My lack of faith in this beautiful knife My knowing of it haunts me I'm haunted And no, oh, I should be afraid Suddenly I wonder why I feel so alone I know there's something out there Thought I'd suck it up and do it all on my own Wish I'd known he does care I'm haunted And oh, I should be afraid Play. Ashamed, give it all up, dropping our pride, rip us apart, 
changes on the inside we cry out to you change us now oh. hey, awake at night crying oh it's not alright to feel like you fall Welcome back. And Francis, I hope you have some questions for us to pose to Oshin. Thanks for joining us, Francis Rowland. Thanks, Mary. And thanks, Oshin. Really good response coming in here from people. And I suppose this line I thought was fantastic. Uh, somebody said they really disliked you, Oshin, when you were playing Kerry, <laughs> but are in awe of the man you have become. So I think that's the loveliest compliment. Um, another person mentioned just jealous of normality. What a phrase and what a way of, of putting your addiction that really spoke to people. Lots of questions here around uh, your experience of ex knowing your own addiction, but not doing anything about it. And your family saying things to you. And I, I suppose a question of, how do you begin to hear that? Uh, were you really in such denial that you couldn't see the woods for the trees? Could you talk? Yeah, about yeah, no, that's a good question. I suppose, like for 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 a long time, uh, it wasn't a, a, that I was in denial. Um, I would have just felt that the way I lived my life was normal because I didn't know any different from fourteen years of age. I suppose then I entered a, a, a phase where I was in denial, if you like. Um, and then at about 25, 26 years of age, uh, I knew exactly what my problem was. I had a fair idea how I was going to turn things around and change things. Um, but when you're in the midst of an addiction, you can tell yourself these things. Like I, I told myself a lot of times, tomorrow is going to be different. Next week's going to be different. I'm going to gamble differently. My relationships are going to be different. I'm going to be more honest. But that never materialized. And the reason why that never materialized because one side of my head was saying all those, all those, these positive things. And there was this other side of my head that was saying, it's, it is going to be different, Ashley, this time. But you can continue to gamble. Gambling is not your issue. You can continue to gamble. The next time you might win. And when you win, then then you can stop. Then you can pay off all your debts and then you can stop. So that's how the cycle continued for me. Um, when my family badgered me, if you like, in particular, I had a brother and sister, uh, I wasn't able to hear it. And the reason why I wasn't able to hear it was that I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for giving up. Uh, I wasn't ready for, uh, for waving the white flag to gambling. Because a little, uh, well, very much unlike the other addictions that we hear about. People who are gamblers see the only way out of their addiction is their addiction, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense whatsoever. Um, so you always think I'm one big bell away from sorting out all my problems. And, uh, and, and until I was ready to hear what they had to say, their concerns, because I know the people around me, everything they did was born out of love, but I didn't see that for four years or five years, I didn't see that. And I couldn't see that. And the reason why I couldn't see that was because I thought they were getting at me. Mm. Whenever I gamble, I wanted to gamble on my terms, by myself, nobody else around. Um, but eventually, one day I started to listen and once one day I heard it. And, and I suppose that's why I ended up um, seeking the help that I sought. Uh, there was it, it sounds dramatic, um, Francis, but uh, like at one stage, like football really was the only thing that was keeping me alive. The only thing that I felt there was any I had any self worth in. Um, it was the only way which I felt as if I could express the person who I was, and um, and I suppose look at you know as I say, 
I couldn't hear it until I could hear it, if that makes any sense. And once I heard it, then uh, I could take it and run with it. But, uh, but for a lot of years, I shunned those people. I had teammates who come to me and said, listen, you know, I borrowed money off them. We don't want the money back. We just want you to get the help that you need. And when they said that to me, I, the first thing I would do is push people like that away. Because I, I, I couldn't see that. I didn't want to hear that. So could I ask you now, as someone who works in counselling and who has gone to the other side, uh, there's people writing in here, you know, parents, siblings, aunts, uncles saying, you know, how do I work with somebody in my life who has an addiction, who can't see it? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to be honest and, and tell them that you're worried about them. And, and even to explain that, you know, everything they do is born out of love and, and the fact that you just want to help them. And I suppose the, the other thing about, about that is that uh, people aren't always ready. But uh, one of the things that one of my sisters would have done on a regular basis was if I jumped into, into the car, there might be a leaflet on compulsive gambling or on my bed beside locker or laying on my bed or even in my football bag sometimes. And, uh, and, and, and eventually that was, I suppose, you pick it up and you read it. And I remember one book in particular that I picked up was just a leaflet, really. But it was 20 questions on whether you're a compulsive gambler or not. Uh, and like, as I already said, academically, it was never very good. Uh, I never did that well in tests, but on that occasion, I got 20 out of 20. And it proves to me that, you know, I really did have a problem yeah. and that I needed to do something about it. So, uh, so there's little tricks, you know, along the way. But a lot of people worry about the vocabulary around uh, approaching somebody. And, uh, and, and, and you don't need to worry about that. You need to, you need to just, all you need to explain to somebody is that, you know, what you're doing is born out of love and, and you just want to help them in whatever way you can. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. And I suppose you you used a few phrases there early on that people have uh, drawn our attention to. You spoke about being insecure and about feeling stripped. And there just a minute ago, you mentioned that really football was the only thing keeping you going. There's a lot of young people today struggling with mental health issues. You know, how do you deal now with the tough days? You know, what what keeps us maybe in a place of greater wellness, if I can put that language on it? Well, just that that is actually quite simple for me. Um, people talk about you know there's like a, a mental health chart, and at the top of that mental health chart, it'll say excelling. I don't think mentally I have ever excelled. The second one on it is balance, and and I think that's where I have been now for some time. There's there's a, a definite balance in my life. So a little bit of exercise. Um, definitely not as much as I used to be. Uh, I try and eat eat as well as I can, uh, and I try and sleep as well as I can, as well as anybody can with three uh, young kids. Um, uh, but I try and create that balance. Okay, I try and create that balance. And, and I suppose the final piece of the jigsaw for me is that as a young lad, I was very closed off, so I wouldn't speak to anybody. There used to be a phrase around this area that was say nothing to nobody. And that was all around, that all surrounded the troubles and all that sort of thing. Well, I sort of took that phrase very, very literally. And I didn't, like you talked, when I was talking to me about football or cars or girls or whatever it was, I would have no problem having a conversation with you. But you talk about emotions or anything like that there, I would run a mile. And that's why I couldn't handle my father's sickness either. You know, because there was a huge amount of sadness around that. And, and as I say, I wasn't fit to deal with those emotions at the time. Um, so the biggest, the most important thing for me when I come through the door from work or from football or whatever is is I, I sit down. Myself and my wife sit down and, and we talk about things and, and it works both ways. You know, she comes home and she, and she talks to me about, you know, sometimes it can just be, listen, I had a great day today. Or even you know, today wasn't so great. Even little things like that, to voice them. And I'll give you one quick example, because I know you're so pushed down, but one quick example was that mm -hmm. during lockdown, I, f I felt myself um, getting very agitated and probably uh, angry. And I, I had a wee lad who's, who's 
the youngest fella in the house who's he's just very social. He loves school, he loves his friends, he loves all that sort of thing. And he wasn't able to, to see them or or you know um or do anything or play or join up for football or any of those sort of things. And uh, and he was struggling big time. And I was getting angrier and angrier. And uh, and I, I let it build up for about probably three weeks to the point where I felt as if it was going to explode for him because of the way I felt for him. And I was actually doing a Zoom, uh, just right in this room um, for work. And I left the Zoom and I went downstairs and told my wife what was happening. And she said she felt the exact same way. <laughs> and two of us looked at each other and laughed because, you know, we, we'd felt that way for some time. And yet, you know, we hadn't voiced it. But as soon as I voiced it, first of all, I felt better. But then I felt as if proactively I could do something about it and start to actively do something about it. But see, when I suppressed it, and I suppressed that feeling. I wasn't able to do anything about it because my anger was getting the better of me. So I suppose that's the uh, that's one of the keys is that you know was creating that balance and then uh, voicing what's happening in my life. You know, and I have, I'm lucky I have that person in the house to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I could just put two more questions to you before Mary comes back in. One is around your faith and what has helped you to grow in terms of your faith. And I suppose the other is in terms of young guys today, and particularly I'll say young guys who seem to be dabbling in drugs. They're also involved in football and hurling. Is there anything GAA clubs can do to support those young people? So whichever way you want to take those, and thank you. Well, I suppose the faith thing is like, um, I didn't turn to God and faith until I needed to, uh, until I felt I needed him. I suppose I had uh, shunned him, but I was always told, regardless of when that time comes, that he would always be there for me. And uh, I was lucky that, you know, when the time did come, he was. And uh, I suppose uh, my faith grew from that point. Uh, I was very bogged down in religion and prayers as opposed to the spiritual side of things. Mm. And as I say, you know, just that that little phrase that Sister Concilio gave me, about spirituality, um, nobody will ever know what that did for me. And first of all, how it made me feel as far as, um, it made me feel very comfortable in what I was doing. It made me feel capable of uh, of having those emotions and, and having that spirituality, um, but also um, a freedom to, to, to then talk about it and, and as I say, pass things on as I, um, as I struggle with them. Um, and as far as what you know, what clubs can do for, for young lads, I suppose clubs can be um, every club is a health and wellbeing officer, and uh, I don't think sometimes we utilize um, these people as, as well as we probably should. Um, they sometimes are not trained, but a lot of times they are the same post to go to the next to the next point. Um, a lot of what I do, I'm the health and wellbeing officer in my club. How did I get that position? Um, I didn't attend the AGM and they thought I'd be the best person to do that. So that's how I ended up in that position. But uh, one of the things that I do is like I, I approach um, like so if, if, a, if, a, if a, a coach in the club comes to me with an issue within a, within a team, then we, we don't single people out. We might run like a, a seminar or, or a workshop and, and, and walk around that and so that everybody gets the opportunity to hear this stuff. But I think a lot of times uh, within society, especially around, uh, you know, uh, drugs and gambling, um, we wait until the crisis point. Uh, we are very, you know, as far as um, uh, tackling these problems when they get to crisis, as opposed to education. And I think a lot of times, you know, we need to educate young people and talk about these things before they become an issue, if that, if that makes any sense. Makes huge sense. And I, I'm just conscious that maybe the last thing uh, you mentioned there was about talking. And uh, that seems to be the, the strength from all of you, what you've said, isn't it? That talking to people, saying how we experience life rather than assuming others are all having a perfect experience and mine is the one that's struggling, is it? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and like if you're like, as I always say, like, you know, whenever I, I, 
I struggle with my demons, you know, for one day to the next. What, you know, I, I want to do the right thing, but, I, but the other side of my head saying I want to gamble. If I express those, if I go downstairs now and I express those feelings to my wife, we can have a conversation, and the conversation is only going to go one way. She's going to take me away from that destructive thinking and that destructive behavior. But if I continue to have all of those thoughts in my head, there's only going to be one winner. And the destructive side of things is going to win. And that's why it's so important that when you are when you are talking that it's, it's to another individual, to share something with another individual. When I shared with another individual, my gambling was never going to be the same again. Yeah. Luckily enough for me, I never gambled after that. But my, I knew once I shared with somebody that the lonely journey I've been on for 16 years, that that was over. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Francis. Really appreciate that. God bless. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Francis, for bringing us those questions. But thanks in particular to you for posing the questions. Oshin, can I go back to you to kind of get your final message, a line or two, what you'd like people to be thinking about after tonight? Well, there's the, I suppose the one thing is, uh, Mary, there's, there, I, there's a lot of negative connotations, and rightly so, with uh, addiction and, and gambling and drugs and alcohol. Um, and as I say, rightly so. But I think it's um, events like this are important because I do believe that there's hope out there. And I don't think a lot of time that message comes through because I think there's a lot of people who get themselves into, uh, into a situation where they feel as if there's no hope, there's no help, and there is loads of help right on your doorstep. And uh, people won't believe it until they actually go on look for it. At 29 years of age, I had no clue the sort of help that I would get if I just uh, put my hand up and asked for it. So that's that's the key. The key is to put your hand up and ask for it. I know how, um, how infuriating it can be for families who have a family member who is um, struggling with addiction, but there is no such thing as a lost cause. That is really great to hear, Oshin, because we're back to the theme of hope and you believe there's hope. And that's great to convey that to people so clearly. And um, thank you very much, Oshin McConville, for joining us tonight. As I said earlier, this is all part of our daily mission schedule, which includes reflections online, your own parish mass or mass online, prayers for children, prayers in the booklet. And if you run into any difficulty accessing any of these, go straight back to dioceseofkerry.ie and you'll find instructions and you'll find links. Good night from me, Mary Fagan. Good night from Ushin, I'm sure as well. Good night from Francis Rowland. Join us tomorrow night on Mission as we have our special guest tomorrow night at eight o'clock is Kate Liffey. Liffey, Kate Liffey, wonderful woman. But we have Mission all day tomorrow again through your links. So um, till tomorrow night when you're with me for Sustained by Love with Kate Liffey. Thanks again, Oshin McConville. And to everybody, Fonagy Sloan, thank you for joining us. Good night. <laughs>